I want to thank all of you for attending today. Our first presentation is an important one and marks an important new step with SRAC and that is our first excavation that we've undertaken. Dr. Weimer, Dan Kaster are going to be our presenters so please give them a warm welcome. is to keep 
detailed and accurate records of what was found, where it was found, the context that it was found in, and what, it, what the associations are of the materials that were found there. So there's a lot of measurement, a lot of drawing, a lot of uh, trying to figure out what kind of natural layers, what kind of stratigraphy you're looking at as you excavate. Um, <clears throat> so we begin by drafting uh, Todd Babcock, who is president of the board at Tioga Point Museum, and a professional surveyor to come in and put a grid, a, a set of baselines for uh, uh, north-south, east-west grid, and he came in with his GPS equipment and within the space of a week had beautiful maps mm -hmm. laying out a grid line of uh, probably 150 yards on an east-west axis and about 20 yards on a north-south axis. And I have to confess or explain that we recorded our excavations in meters metric because that's scientific convention these days. Um, I'm going to be talking in terms of feet and yards because that's what people are familiar with, but there's a, a large potential and I'm going to get them screwed up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens. Keep, so. uh, keep in mind as well that one of the important reasons for doing this first sort of grid system and, and laying everything out so that we know where we are in the landscape because if in the future more work is to be done at the site or at the sites that I work on in Ohio and Egypt and other areas, some of those we've gone back to for, you know, two, three, 10, 15 years. So we need to know exactly where we had already worked so that we can then work from that and add to that knowledge. So a grid system helps us put it in the real landscape of today, as well as keep track, as Dan noted, of all materials that we find as we're working. Um, Sorry. That's okay. I, I have a great example of, of why that's important. Um, and I'm going to diverge because it turns out we've got more time to talk than we thought we did. So. Uh, That's I can go off on tangents, but at the Castle Creek site in Vestal, New York, um, excavations were conducted back in the 60s and early 70s, and then SUNY Binghamton went back there about 10 years ago, and they spent a week trying to figure out where the 1970s excavations had actually been located. And I've had, I've had similar experiences. The like landscape that. had changed enough and it was difficult. So we're hoping to avoid that with a miracle of modern GPS technology. Todd promises that he can go back to within one inch of where he put the stakes in 10, 20 years from now. We like that. Yes, we do. Precision is always good. So we start by putting in test pits, um, one by one meter units. And because we don't really know where the actual occupation levels, if any, were. Uh, this is kind of random, but to speak to the topography, it's overlooking the Susquehanna River. There's a low rise up from the river bank, then a dip again into a flow channel that really apparently only gets used or, or filled, water filled, every five or ten years when there's a an exceptional flood, uh, and then a rise to a really high terrace, um, and that's where the bulk of the material was found when we did our walkover. Um, we're finding pieces of pottery, uh, hearthstone uh, chips from making stone tools and so on up on that high terrace. So that's where we located our initial test pits. Uh, the one that you see here, um, is located in an area that turned out to be pretty sterile. I mean, we spent 
what done. We spent about a month digging and not finding much of anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty boring. Yeah, it was pretty boring. Uh, uh, the joys of we, Yes, especially when the temperature's in the 90s. And, you know. uh, we did eventually uncover this arc of what we call firecrack rock. These are uh, large cobbles, river cobbles, that we think were used to line a, a fire pit or heat it up to use in stone boiling because until um, 1,500, 2,000 years ago, there were no ceramic, no pottery containers. So they're boiling in birch bark and wooden vessels and they're doing it by dropping hot stones into the, into the vessel. Um, we found this arc, and I wish I had a pointer, but you can see there's gradual, generally an arc, and then it's got sort of a, <coughs> a, a string of stone that's peeled off, in this case, in a southerly direction. That, we think, is plow damage. That the farmer, when this was planted in corn, plowed right through this thing and pulled the arc of stone off to the south. Um, <clears throat> but the significant thing for us at the time was we weren't finding much in terms of artifacts in this area. So eventually we came back and removed half of the, the stone in this unit and discovered a dense layer of charcoal immediately underneath that firecrack rock. So the impression we have, the interpretation is built an intense fire, got really hot, roaring hot, put the rocks in on top to heat them up, and then did something with these hot rocks. We're, we're guessing that it's what's called an earth oven. And some of you were in the scouts, remember wrapping potatoes in aluminum foil, sticking it in a fire and covering it up with dirt. That's basically the, the technology we're like looking at. Like an ancient here. Dutch oven. Yeah, exactly. So, but again, very little in terms of artifacts, no stone tools, no pottery associated, or only small pieces of pottery associated. And then Dee Ann, who is a paleoethnobotanist, i.e. she analyzes botanical materials from archaeological sites, looked at the wood charcoal and I can look at even the littlest, tiniest fragment, like the size of your fingernail, of wood charcoal from a campfire. I look at the cell structure, you know how trees have the tree rings? You can see when you cut, well, if I look at the cells within those tree rings, I can tell you what the, the original tree was. So I looked at the wood charcoal, and it turned out to be pine, which was a little bit surprising, because in that river bottom kind of setting, you don't see naturally. Pine is not a natural part of the forest community there. And what it tells me is, not surprisingly, that uh, there's some disturbance. What's probably going on is some of the forest have been cleared <coughs> for fields, uh, living, you know, just general living areas. And pine tends to grow back in in these kind of open disturbed areas. So it's a little bit of a clue to how the ancient humans interacted and impacted their environment. So, um, as I said, we found very little artifactual material. We opened a couple of units around this. They were pretty empty. We got bored and moved on. And when we moved on, we moved east to an area that had been scraped for topsoil. Um, so the plow zone, unlike the 8 to 10 inch depth that we were finding in our initial units, was only 2 to 3 inches deep here because the top of it had been scraped off and used in somebody's garden. Uh, again, we did a couple of test pits and here we found uh, some real dark charcoal immediately under that plow zone. And we're going, oh boy, we've got fire pits or refuse dumps or something going on here. And you can see the pattern 
when, when we encountered that, we then opened up a larger area, opened up adjacent one by one meter units, so we've got a wider area exposed with the plow zone taken off. And you can see the pattern of dark soil on this two meter by two meter square that we've got here. That's representing charcoal in, in, in the soil. You know, it's, it's very boy, fine. Boy, did we um, scratch our heads. I'm trying to figure out what, <laughs> we're trying to figure out a pattern. Like, yeah. what's, what usually, what you'll find is a big circular stain. And to think if you cut a big pit down into the ground, like three or four feet, and then fill it up with organic material and charcoal and stuff. And then if you cut the surface of it, so you have to think in three dimension when you do archaeology. It's the, for me the fun part. So normally you would see a really distinctive oval or circular, you know, pattern, and then you know that you're on top of a pit. And we got this and we're like, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. That's looking weird. Very strange pattern. It's definitely not a nice big circular refuse pit. And one of the things we have found on this site, and I'll spoil the surprise, is boy, have the groundhogs been busy here. <laughs> My God, you get down two feet, and all of a sudden you get this big area of real loose soil because some groundhog has dug himself a den and parked there for the winter, and then it's filled in with soil that's fallen out of the It's walls. the soil softer than the surrounding soil. Yeah. They're not stupid, right? so they're going to dig in this. Fortunately, the softer soil is all the stuff that we wanted. Yeah. So what we found is there's a fair amount of, uh, and, and you got to love them, academics have these great words <laughs> for obvious stuff. So the word is bioturbation. <laughs> that is, something alive has been turning the soil over, you know, whether it's plant roots, tree roots, uh, insects, we're finding beetle burrows a, a yard deep. In and, then, and then on top of it, then you had the plow, the yeah. farmer's plow go through it. That's what the, those sort of linear dark streaks. So archaeology is, is, is not for the timid. <laughs> And for folks that like to guess up stuff, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we opened up this block and uh, started investigating it in more detail. Um, this is the beginning of opening up that two by two meter block. Um, and that's gradually what we ended up with. And what we're looking at here in this lower slide, the feature on the far left is a pit. We'll see that in a minute. It's more of a classic pit, uh, a classic hearth uh, when we encountered it. Um, the feature in the middle was what we call feature five, and that's the bulk of that charcoal stained area in the two by two meter square. Um, and then this little hole over here on the right was feature six, which is a really dark, very classically shaped, uh, very small pit. It's only about a foot wide at the top and maybe nine or ten inches deep at the bottom, but it's got a rodent burrow right through the middle. So uh, we puzzled back and forth for a while about whether it's a real feature or not. But, um, Features, again, are oddly enough a technical term, which basically means some disturbance or um, element that you find in the soil that you can't take back to the lab. Um, so it includes things like foundations and post molds and refuse pits and fire pits, <coughs> and you name it, all of that stuff that um, has to be investigated in the field and is, has to be recorded in some detail. Um, so, that's the orange circles identify 
the areas of feature four in the background, feature five in the foreground here. And it turns out that that's kind of a, this was early in the excavation, and that's a small uh, estimate of the size of feature five, which turned out to be uh, a lot more time consuming than we anticipated. Here's feature four, and as, as Dean was saying, it's got a nice circular outline, dense charcoal inside, uh, a fire cracked rock in the middle of it, classic feature. Uh, the treatment for those is to cut it in half so that you can eventually get a vertical profile, a vertical outline of the feature as it originally existed. So, so Don, Don standing in feature four and the nice profile shot of Dan is... <laughs> That's feature we five. always have great profile shots in archaeology. <laughs> is working in feature five. As you can see from where Don's standing, feature four got bigger. <laughs> yeah, feature four kept going. And we're still working on it. Yeah, um, so at the point where Don is working on it, on the left hand picture there, we're down about, I think, 28 inches. Uh, below the surface, and it's still going. Um, we think maybe a week ago we finally hit bottom, but we're not sure yet. We still have some work to do. And, and do you see do you see the rocks in the photo, right? And over by his feet too. Those are not just rocks. Those are what we call firecrack rocks. So those are uh, rocks that are heated to a certain degree. They have a really distinctive sort of breakage pattern. They kind of rupture open. So we can always tell if they're, you know, rocks that are there because humans have done something. So they're not broken by the plow, for example. So those are actually um, fire crack rock from when those were used by ancient populations. All right, go ahead. So um, feature five, again, some more pictures of it. And then feature five, after about three weeks worth of work on it, um, and this in the display in the next room that records what we found to date, there's a nice it's picture, clearer profile of this wall on feature five. But as you can see, we're down about four feet there, um, and have finally decided that we're out of the feature, um, although we continued to find artifacts, very small artifacts, all the way down. Um, what we're seeing in the wall there is pot shirts, pretty good sized pot shirts, pot shirts like that, which for us in these sites is And big. you'll see it uh, after, you know, uh, later on when there's a break, something in the day, if you take a look at the new display, You'll actually see that pottery. They turn out to be pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff, yes. Um, and notice that the way we've we've done the excavation is in kind of a checkerboard pattern, because what that does for us is give us it maximizes the profiles that we can get. So we can get one profile in the west wall of the far left unit, in the north wall of the middle unit in the east wall of the far right unit. So that that one we can kind of tell the shape of it. Yeah, so hopefully it's going to outline the shape. Okay. And so watch. here's what we think the shape of this is. Do you see that? What we're looking at, what we're following, are subtle changes, sometimes dramatic changes in color, soil texture, and also, of course, the placement of the, art, the artifacts. So what it looks like is, thus, at least thus far, but we are still working on, is someone broke one or several, what had been a beautiful big pot, um, gathered the, the, those broken pieces all up, along with general garbage, probably cleaning out the house, 
and they just then threw them down in the bottom of probably, it may have been something like an earth oven, and then, you know, after a while, what do you do with the hole in the ground? Just like we, you know, uh, Grandpa used to throw the 55 Chevy into the ravine behind the farm. So that's what they're doing. So the pottery is actually lining the bottom of the pit. So it's helping us to see the shape of it. Yeah, and, and to further confirm that, the pieces that came out adjacent to this, and we've got uh, 15 or 16 potsherds uh, that came out of the unit that's been excavated already here in this picture, and they're all nested one inside the other, all with their interiors facing up, which tells us they didn't just throw the pot into the bottom. Somebody actually picked this up and said, here, kid, take it over and put it in refuse stuff. So, and this is the thing that I really like, is we're catching, in a way that's unusual in archaeology, we're catching a single daily activity that happened centuries ago, you know? Clean up, something we're all familiar with, but it's an activity that happened in the space of maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour 500 years ago. And archaeologically, you don't get events like that outside of typically burials, okay, which we're hoping to avoid. Um, so, <clears throat> <clears throat> we continued to work on feature five. Uh, that set of sherds is um, sticking out of the wall. Uh, we get down to this level, which, doing the math in my head, is about two feet below the surface. There's a couple of big rocks. These are probably not firecrack rocks. These are rocks that were put there for some reason maybe just to get them out of the way, but uh, definitely not left over from the fire. We're getting some additional pottery back in that floor of that unit, uh, which I'm busy taking out over here. Um, and we got <coughs> so what we saw in the wall profile before in the picture that outlined the bottom of the pot is what we this is what it looked like after we started coming down on it through feature five, and it turned out to be um, about four or five big rim shirts. And rim shirts are the top. Yeah, they're the top of the pot. And they're where the decoration is found. And the decoration is what typically gives you some idea of the age of this, because decorative styles change through time. Um, so we got this. Uh, pieces are reconstructed and up on, the, on display on the top shelf in the next room. So I'd encourage you to look at it, because it's a big pot. I mean, if you stop and think about the technology that they were using, uh, this pot, we estimate, had a rim diameter of about 10 inches and a belly diameter of about uh, probably close to two feet, you know, maybe 14 inches. So we're talking, what, a three gallon, four gallon pot that had to be fired in an open air wood covered fire. And, you know, doing an adequate job of firing a pot that big with that kind of technology is not easy. Um, it ain't that easy when you're using a kiln and you can control the temperature. But when you're just, you know, piling sticks on top and trying to keep the fire going and so on, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so, feature five kept going down. Okay, there's the rim shirts exposed. Um, and what we think we may have 
is this nice circular stain uh, that <coughs> indicates a post mold. You make a disturbance in the soil, you put a post in, you leave the post there and it rots, you get organic staining in the soil. I hit the wrong thing. <laughs> it's not on the screen. <laughs> um, and what's unusual is this is only the second thing we found here that we think might be a post mold, and the first one turned out to be a groundhog burrow. <laughs> um, so, post molds are important because if you get enough of them, they may outline a structure. And the structure may be really looking for it in the back. No, no, it just works really differently. It does. I'm going to try to get the other photo off. Yeah. 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 They're yeah. usually round. <laughs> Pardon? No, I'm Somebody wanted to know how you found a post hole. We came down on it from the top, and there's a circular stain. And my reaction, because this happened, aha! Uh -huh. Whoa! Whoa! Yes. Asking each other. Aliens. Aliens have landed. We're being attacked. And it looks like a mouse. What? I'm, <laughs> stealing, pink I'm totally stealing this. <laughs> so, okay. if you look carefully, right? As we're coming down, so there's the pottery. We're sort of focusing on that, right? Um, do you see this right here? You see a slightly kind of circular, darkular stain? It's not real obvious. And then as we go down deeper, though, you, do you see this? That one's really obvious. Yeah. Imagine taking a, 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 a large sapling, like think of like a giant pencil, like that post, with a sharpened. Somewhere. With right here. Right here. Oh, like that. Oh, yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah. With um, uh, the end point sharpened like a pencil. Stick it in the ground, right? And then it decays or it gets pulled out, and then you get darker soil in it. And then you cut this way across it. What you see is this beautiful circular stain. And I'm, I'm pretty darn certain that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, my reaction was, oh crap, because um, they take uh, some detail in excavation that uh, I was hoping yeah, to we're avoid. No, we've state, not excavated yet. Because we wanted to get this unit done before the meeting today. Not going to happen. Uh, so, uh, the interesting thing, and one of the things I'd like to point out is, there's a lot going on at this level. We're down at uh, 60 centimeters, which somebody else can do with us, two feet. Um, and we got firecrack rock there. That was underneath that big flat rock that we saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, you got this post mold here. That's another rim shirt sticking out of the wall. So far, it's about uh, five inches or six inches long. So it's <clears throat> the rim and a good part of the neck. And it's not from the pot that these came from. You can tell. Even though what we're looking at is the interior, you can tell by looking at the fact that the interior is decorated that it's a different pot. So. This was a busy little refuse pit in its day. Um, so, what are we getting in terms of artifacts? Um, nice. Yeah. This is known as Deb's Big Rim Shirt. Yes! <laughs> Because she found it. Uh, I hope you We're not competitive out there. <laughs> no. At all. No, not at all. No, no, no. Uh, um, and what it has on it is a herringbone pattern made with cord wrapped sticks or the edge of a cord wrapped paddle of some kind. They're using a cord wrapped paddle to malleate, to 
form the outside of the pot, the body of the pot, and using the hand inside, uh, and then using cord wrap, stick, or paddle to decorate the rim. And this is decorated with a herringbone pattern that goes oblique, and then oblique, and oblique, and oblique. Um, so, and that's a very classic <coughs> pottery style for this particular time period. Uh, this, that also came from Feature 5. Um, this is... The bigger! The, Tom's big The biggest! <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's on display, actually, in the, the next room. So you can take a look and see where it came out of. Uh, that feature five profile. Uh, that has this kind of decoration, which is called plaited. There are vertical bars of horizontal cord wrap stick impressions, or slightly oblique angular bars, but the bars are separated. So those are called plaits for some reason, and they go down from the rim all the way to the shoulder of the pot. Uh, so that's a different pot. Two, two different vessels here. Herringbone decoration versus platted. Again, both very, very typical. And typical enough that we have similar examples from the round top site at Griffin Park in Endicott, New York. So same pots, you know, same pottery style from 40 miles up the river in a site that's associated with long houses and corn, beans, and squash. Um, these pots are probably predate the long houses, but we have examples of uh, three of the five pots that are uh, illustrated in this place. So, you know, we're very much in a cultural tradition that goes at least that far up the river probably goes even farther uh, up into central New York. Um, so, now what? Stone tools. Uh, Mike is really excited because he's got a net sinker, a notched flat rock. Um, and that came out of the top of Feature 5, one of those charcoal stains in the, the feature that we illustrated. I think that's wait, I think that's actually my ankles were in there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually was there. I took all the photos. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think that one had I think you caught my foot. <laughs> <laughs> what strikes me as odd about this site is there's very little evidence of stone tool manufacture on this site. We're not finding well, but we're, mm -hmm. but except for, yeah. ah, yeah. all right, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I haven't got to the qualifications, he accepts, but. <laughs> um, we're not finding many stone tools or stone tool fragments. I think maybe five or six. Uh, this little skinny thing here is probably a drill, a uh, chip stone drill. Uh, Lori is holding up a piece of what might have been a point, but it's just a chip off the edge of, of the point. Uh, we've got this funky looking thing, and we have no idea what that is. Um, but most of the stone tools, were, or the stone refuse we're finding, is very small resharpening or shaping chip. I mean, we're talking fingernail size, right? We have about 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, no problem. Uh, um, so it, it's interesting if we're talking, if we're in a residential area where, you know, they're carrying around these big pots, you would expect that there'd be more evidence of stone tool manufacture. And that's one of the things that I, I think we need to pursue for future research. And now, he is so anxious, I'll turn it over to her. Yes, about time. <laughs> <laughs> they say women like the dog. I don't know. All right, so um, 
As uh, Dan noted, my laboratory specialization is the analysis of plant materials from archaeological sites. So what we do is we actually take some of the soil from that dirt that you saw, particularly the darker material, and in my lab, using um, water, I separate that material, any charred material, any small artifacts out of that dirt matrix, and then I analyze it in a microscope. So this is, I just got two smaller samples done. Um, so this is very preliminary, but what you're seeing here is this is the material that's floated up and out of the soil. So this is all the light charred material. Um, I also have a material that is a little bit heavier as well, has the smaller artifacts in it. How do I do this? Here's, here's the, the, the kind of interesting and odd stuff. Definitely there's a really good amount of organic charred material that's there. That's not surprising. It's largely wood charcoal. I found fragments of pine and red oak. The red oak is absolutely what I would expect. Here's the weird thing. For this time period, which I will show you exactly at least the, our first radiocarbon date in a moment. There should be, and the expectations are that these are heavily maize agriculture growing the three sisters, corn, beef, and squash. Thus far, I've not seen any evidence at all of corn, of maize. And uh, I did a huge amount of the screening over the days. Uh, my knees are a little bit bad. Didn't see any evidence. There's nothing like that at all in these samples. Um, there's hickory nutshell. Um, I did see some small seeds. I think we might actually have a blueberry. Now here's the weird one. It's only going to be exciting to us strange geeks. There were a couple of charred seeds of a little tiny kind of weedy plant called goose foot. You wouldn't even recognize it. It's mostly stuff you pull out of your gardens. But in early times it was a crop long before corn and beans came into the area. Wow. This was the original, I told you I had a surprise, this is the original um, farming system before maize, you know, eventually came up through from Mexico and up through Texas. And I think one of them might be a domesticate form, meaning that it does represent an early, if that's the case, this will be the first <coughs> reporting of this for this region. Awesome. All right, but take that, yeah, but take that, as you know, with, with a big question mark until I do some more samples. I, I can say they are charred goose foot specimens. It could be weeds in their agricultural fields, but there's no corn at all, uh, which I'm very surprised by. And as you can see, although there's not a lot of finished tools, there's lots and lots and lots of beautiful flakes, chips of flint from tool manufacture and the resharpening of the edges of tools. So it's, it's kind of puzzling. There's some puzzles involved in this site. And here's another big puzzle. Now, out of feature four, not, not the big one, feature five yet, but out of feature four, we took and I got a really nice half a complete specimen of charred hickory nut. Um, and some wood from Future 5, and I sent them off after identification to a special <coughs> laboratory down in Florida. What they do is they take these specimens, um, they, have a, they fire them up in a really intense oven and until they're vapor, and then they count the number of radioactive carbon atoms are left in a very fancy Geiger count. It's a lot of physics. The bottom line is this. Once they're done with the process, they can tell you when that hickory nutshell died, when someone harvested and used it, when that wood was chopped down and used. And point out why the nutshell is much more... And we de very deliberately chose the nutshell because that was produced in one year, right? One year the tree makes the nut and it's used. One of the problems with wood and wood charcoal is if someone cuts down like a 300 year old oak and I accidentally get a, a chunk that's from the center of it, 
it's measuring, you know, the, uh, the oak when it was a young sapling, when that wood was laid down, so the dates could be off. So we, we try to get things that help us be as accurate as possible. So nutshell, beautiful thing to use. Now, I was expecting the site to date to 800, 700 AD. Well, we have a bit of a surprise announcement. I literally, as of like a day, day ago, got the results from the lab. Are you ready? I made the PowerPoint. I can't help it. <laughs> what? What? Now, it's complicated as physics and science, okay? Um, the bottom line is the best guess is somewhere around the mid-1300s to later. So about 1375 is the labs telling me this is the best kind of midpoint, all right? That is way, way more recent in time than I expected, although, as Dan notes, they do find this pottery from this time frame. The plants don't seem to match it. No corn. No, no corn. But, but keep in mind that we barely, no pun intended, scratch the surface. So for example, if this is from what we call it, you know, in the time period of late woodland, you know, to late prehistoric, um, village sites, some of those village sites got very, very large. So you could have easily, um, now this is a, a site that was done um, um, just I think south of, south of here. And what it's showing you is some of these, these villages, you have lots of different rectangular or in some cases even circular houses depending where you're at. And then lots and 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 lots all those, those dots you see are the big refuge pits the archaeologists found. So we've got a smidgen of you know what could be a fairly large extensive site and wouldn't be surprised. The problem is this time period, this region is a mystery. There's been little uh, professional, yeah, no, very little organized professional work. Clearly what's going on is whatever is, is going on here is very different from down <laughs> the southern Susquehanna, southern Delaware region where a lot of professional work has, has been going on. Um, and as you can see, they've uh, got most of the work's gone down in uh, southern Pennsylvania. There's some up here, but uh, those may be recorded but not excavated. And here's the biggest question. When did the Iroquois come in? Who were those populations? We realize now that was a very complex thing that would happen. And it looks like that those folks that became the Iroquois did not come into southern Susquehanna region until maybe the 1300s. And they originally were, as the archaeologists are, are perhaps wondering, from further south. It fits their own moral traditions, which is really interesting. So they're from somewhere south, southern you know, areas of, of, of here. Then came up and then up into, through Susquehanna region, up into around the uh, Lake Erie area. Um, interacting with, displacing, absorbing, becoming neighbors with the original population. So this site is of that intriguing time frame when you had very different peoples coming together. Just before, of course, when you had uh, <coughs> colonists from the old world come in and then disrupt all life waves um, forever. So this is a fascinating site, absolutely fascinating. We still have many questions. Um, but it was an incredibly great experience, not only to touch upon the heartstone of the past, but also to come together as a team, to work together for a greater, uh, larger goal. Cut it out. Uh -huh. Wait, wait. And I, I'm going to show you the most classic photo now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I got pictures of you coming up. So. Okay. <laughs> that phone did not stop ringing. That woman can deal. <laughs> all right. And Dan? Yeah, I, we really wanted to 
give a shout out to all of the people who have helped over the past four or five months in this excavation. <coughs> um, some people were only out for uh, a day or maybe two days. Uh, Tom Vallely has been workhorse. a workhorse. He's been there every time we stuck a shovel or a trowel in the ground. Um, that guy the can one do person, I'll tell you. We're really good. The one person who isn't on the list and should have been, again, is Todd Babcock from Tioga Point, right. who gave us, as I say, great maps and a great baseline to start our excavations on. So, um, and I was I, glad we could get Ted Keir out there as well. Yeah. 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 So, do we have any questions? Comments? Great job. Yeah.